All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Dave Shirazi, who's just up the road in Thousand Oaks in, uh, in California, just outside Los Angeles. And Dave is the owner of TMG, uh, TMJ rather, and Sleep Therapy Center. How are you doing, Dave? I'm great. Good morning. How are you? Excellent. Great. And uh, and today we're going to talk about a, a topic that I think everybody has an interest in, um, and that is sleep. Because I, to be honest, I don't think I know anybody who's recently ever come up to me and said, you know, John, I sleep great all the time. But I hear plenty <laughs> of people come up and say, you know, I, I, str I struggle with sleep or I'm having these bouts of insomnia or I have you know, some uh, sleep disorders or whatever. So sleep is a is a big is a really big issue, as we know, because it's very, very hard to, to function at your optimal level if you're not getting the proper amount of sleep. So first of all, uh, Dave, one of the th one of the things I just want to ask you is, is have you seen have you seen like in your business an increase in people who are having issues with sleep? Oh, for sure. This being my focus. Um, <laughs> absolutely. People come in and, you know, they, they actually had relatively poor sleep before, but I think with the state of the world right now, the, you know, I don't even call it the news. I call it the bad news. Um, yeah. Kind of, you know, something you should definitely avoid. Um, but, you know, if you, if you dare to look at it before you go to bed, uh, it, it, it'll push you a bad way off. Um, yeah, no, I agree. And I think that's you know, part of the problem, obviously, is the inputs that we're putting into our head, uh, you know, before we go to bed or, or maybe even throughout the day. Uh -huh. So what are what are the some of the things that you can just anybody, regardless of whether you have a, 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 you know, a sleep disorder per se or just have difficulty sleeping? What are some of the things people can do to to optimize their sleep? Well, I definitely don't want to ignore uh health issues like diseases if you will that mm -hmm. disturb our sleep but to before we get to that just to answer your question we have a uh like a screening form that we give our patients called uh sleep hygiene form where we basically you know ask them what they do in the bedroom and tell them that this is what we recommend and i'll give you like the cliff notes that's the cheat mm -hmm. notes on it we want the bedroom first of all to be only used for sleep and sex, right? No eating, no family meeting, no working on the laptop on the bed. No, the bedroom is for sleeping and sex. That's it, right? And usually right after sex comes sleeping. So yeah. if that's, that's the convenience of it. So we want it very dark. We don't want any light sources. And it can get tricky because people have sometimes uh, a lamp that still has a residual amount of light in it. They, you know, we, I haven't had a television in my master bedroom in 15 years mm. or so, something like that, at least 10. Um, and the reason is one, you know, my wife likes the white noise and I don't, but the other is there's these little red lights on the bottom of the TV and that's, that's light, right? right? Our brains cannot tell the difference between a photon of light that comes from that red dot, from an iPhone, from a tablet, uh, or the sun. So it, it messes our circadian rhythm by just letting us know that there's light still out there. Yeah. Mm. Uh, we want it cool, about 65 to 68 degrees is the optimum temperature. And just personally speaking, I have a much easier time. If it's colder than that, I'll just wear some more blankets. But if it's hotter than that, it's so hard to fall asleep. It is, it is brutal. Um, so we've got the temperature. we got, uh, it's got to be okay. quiet, of course. Yeah. Yeah, and just uh, just on what you mentioned so far, so okay, so if we were to if we were to look at a, a, a typical master bedroom, um, 
we will probably, as you said, we'll probably see a TV in it. Um, people's phones plugged in beside the bed, uh, all of that. So there's uh, maybe not the greatest of, um, you know, shading on the windows or whatever. So there's, so what you've just outlined here, there's probably like a lot of people or maybe even the majority of people who have exactly the opposite setup to the one you just described. I, I completely agree. Um, and just to add about the light source. So I sometimes get on my phone when I'm in bed, but I wear blue blocker glasses, those orange ones when mm -hmm. I'm on it. And I don't touch my phone when it's plugged in. There's a whole different level of EMF radiation that comes from the phone when it's plugged in. So definitely you want to avoid that. Um, I was talking about silence. Yeah. So, you know, having a bed partner that snores or you that snores or has sleep apnea or a noisy neighbor's dog uh, basically cuts into the stages of sleep that we're in and the cycling that we have. So, for example, we have four stages of sleep, stage one, two and three, and then REM. One and two is lighter sleep, more a little bit of physical rest kind of like closing your eyes and, you know, resting alpha state. Uh, stage three is Delta. And we get almost a hundred percent of our growth hormone in that stage, right? Mm -hmm. After we're done growing, we need growth hormone to physically repair. Yeah. And then REM, we, that's, it's not just for dreaming. That's where we get our mental, emotional uh, consolidation and resolution of the things that we're processing. And we're even research is coming out and finding out that we have a lymphatic system in our brain that clears out the beta amyloid plaques during REM. So when someone is snoring or you're choking in your sleep, whatever it is, what, what will happen is you'll, you know, as you have those respiratory events, you'll mm -hmm. kick yourself out from Delta or REM into a lighter stage of sleep, right? And that's the most important stages of sleep. Those two stages of sleep are more important than diet and exercise for longevity and health. That's that's really interesting. And and in some ways, if you think about it, like uh, you know, especially especially here, right? There's and you know, professionals and and uh, there's a kind of a, a culture where we almost celebrate the people who don't sleep very much. You know, like like they. And they and, and all of this and 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 I often really kind of question that piece. Well, I mean, I, I'm glad you do, um, and especially being from Ireland, um, mm -hmm. you know, in America we have this corporate mentality, right? Um, and we even have what's called corporate apologists, people who justify atrocious acts of. Uh, raping of, of, you know, human workforce into slavery uh, because there is this, because the American dream was such a real thing. Uh, people have become in America what, what I call uh, temporarily financially embarrassed millionaires. Right. And, and though there are some that do work hard, you know, they have a vision, they have a dream. They work hard towards that dream. And sometimes sleep is compromised for a relatively short period of time. Yeah. You're not, you know, um, but, you know, there is this culture in the U.S. where we just acquiesce to this corporate lifestyle of you have to sacrifice for the for the corporation. And of course, it's OK that Jeff Bezos has two hundred billion dollars and his employees wear diapers so that they don't waste time going to the bathroom. It's just business. You know, it's, there is this unbelievable resolution to um, this evil corporate, you know, mindset. And what you just said is like, to me, is just like another one of the red flags, another one of the red flags, but you're just sort of like, get in there and boom, you're, it's like, okay, well, I need to do all of these things because profit <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know yeah yeah and no it's it's it, it, it's interesting you know it's very interesting because as i said i mean there's very few people ever come up to you and say i'm getting enough sleep and my sleep is great everybody's say they're not getting enough or they're 
um, they're exhausted. Uh, but obviously, there's also, you know, and this is, you know, a lot of the work you do, there is there are people with real like um, sleep issues. But that's right. Um, how do you recognize because i think sometimes people don't recognize them i mean you recognize them obviously if you've got something serious going on then you know you go to a sleep specialist or whatever but you may have something going on with your sleep that is is a serious issue or whatever but you don't recognize it so what are some of the signs that you may have sleep issues well sleep issues is such a broad you know term <laughs> Um, in the context, uh, well, I mean, people usually know when they have insomnia, right? Difficulty falling sure. asleep, difficulty staying asleep and waking up early, like let's say four and mm -hmm. 5 a.m. and can't go back to sleep. Those are primary, secondary, and tertiary insomnia. What's really the most both lethal and hidden uh, sleep issue is sleep apnea. Okay. Right. Sleep apnea is associated either directly or indirectly with every single known disease we know. Other than diseases that are purely genetic, um, it's associated with every single thing we know. And even then, even diseases that are purely genetic, if you don't get the rest and restorative section of your sleep, it makes it much more difficult to manage your genetic disorder. Right. So mm -hmm. we know that sleep apnea and snoring is related to high blood pressure. And we know this because we see the correlation. And then when we resolve the sleep apnea, the blood pressure issues either resolve or greatly reduce. We see the same thing with type 2 diabetes, with anxiety and depression, with Parkinson's, right? Of course, with TMJ disorders, which is my uh, focus as well. So uh, the Journal of American Medical Association came out with a study with 1,400 patients where they did, uh, they took patients aged 30 to 60, and they had them gauge their uh, depression, right? There's something right. called a Zung's depression scale, and you basically check off how depressed you are uh, from the baseline of, I sometimes have sad thoughts, to I consider suicide every day, like you, you get a score. Well, they did sleep studies on them and they found out the overlap between the severity of their depression and the severity of their sleep apnea was one to one. It was completely, there was no mistaking it. It was right there. And um, of course, with follow-up studies, either with oral appliances, which is again, my focus, or with CPAP, when they treat patients with, you know, we call it psychosocial issues, um, with either oral appliance therapy or CPAP, we see a great improvement in their right. depression and anxiety. So um, it, it's very hard to know that. In fact, you know, I coined a term called secondhand snoring a while back. <laughs> <laughs> the Cleveland Clinic did a great study. I think they started with like 1,100 patients where they did sleep studies on both the husband and the wife in bed. And just for sake of argument, let's say the men had the apnea and the women did. Right. Well, the men with, with the sleep apnea, of course it was both, but generally speaking, the men with sleep apnea had an average of 27 arousals an hour. An arousal is when you get kicked out of those two deep stages of sleep I was talking about for 10 seconds or greater, mm -hmm. which is really at the heart of most of the problems that we have from sleep apnea or any sleep disorder. So the bed partner with no apnea and no snoring had 21 arousals an hour, mm. which, it, which is horrific. So yeah, yeah, yeah. they whittled down those 1,100 patients down to 150 that stuck with the CPAP, right? And of course, the patients with CPAP that tolerated it could sleep better. They slept great. But then they went to the bed partner. And they said, oh, you know, they didn't do follow-up studies on them, but they asked them anecdotally, how are you doing since your, you know, bed partner has been wearing the CPAP? Oh, wow, my headaches are gone. My, I'm not moody anymore. You know, my kids tell me I'm much easier to get along with, <laughs> you know? And it's like, we, we see this kind of thing literally all the time. 
Yeah, no, it's 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 fascinating, isn't it? Um, because yeah, because we're we're obviously conditioned to say, okay, well, if you've got the issue, then you then that's okay. I'm, you know, I'm okay. But clearly, the the the, the residual, as you said, your your secondhand uh, your secondhand snoring. Um, so, so how many? I mean, I mean, I know this is almost an impossible question, but. Uh, mm-hmm. but but in your in your professional opinion, are there a lot of people suffering from th- from things like sleep apnea that's going untreated or undetected? Mm-hmm. It's an epidemic for sure. Um, you know, the average uh, American is overweight. Um, obesity and morbid obesity is on the rise. But even then, the weight gain only exasperates what you already have. So sleep apnea is very typically a neuromuscular tone deficiency in these upper pharyngeal muscles. So we, they, they did studies on uh, college-aged females with a BMI under 20, so thin, young women. Mm-hmm. And 50% of them had sleep apnea. Wow. So we just don't have the neuromuscular tone. It's, it's not, you know... I embarrassingly, I talk to physicians all the time who will say, oh, I can spot my patients with sleep apnea, no problem. They're, they're the roly polies, they're the fat patients. And it's like, no, I mean, yeah, probably they are too, <laughs> but, but you know, it, it can happen to anyone. And, and that's the thing, you know, we have a medical system right now that is more focused on symptom management, usually with pharmaceuticals, rather than, hey, how are you sleeping? What's your diet like? What are the thoughts you tell yourself during the day? You know, you know, and we yeah. need to get to that point. And I think people are fed up with it. I think people yeah. are like, all right, listen, I've been on this medication and it has just barely coped, you know, with the issue. And then now it's causing other problems <laughs> to take yeah. Yeah. medication for it. Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's so strange that we're still there's a still a certain amount of resistance to the mind body connection, uh, and uh, and that is you know what you're talking about here is um, as you said like what what are the inputs what's your routines what's your all of these kind of mm-hmm. things um, mm-hmm. into your brain but we still seem we still seem to resist and the, and in many ways the medical profession still seems to really resist that mind body connection it's like they want to operate as two completely separate. Uh, feels if you like they do and that's really owing to their training um i actually i don't tolerate bad mouthing to doctors because sure. they're really just doing what they were taught you know my mm. i have a family member who's uh, has been graduated from usc medical school right very pre- prestigious very smart guy and i asked him so um how many hours of training did you get on sleep disorders anything at all i didn't even say sleep apnea anything to do with sleep. And he looked at me and he just gave me a big fat zero. Yeah. So something that we do one third out of every day of our lives that is responsible for our growth hormone and our mental emotional processing, they get zero training for, right? And I'm not picking on USC. They're pretty sure. much all like that. They're pretty yeah. much all like that. Yeah, no, I know. I, that's a fascinating, fascinating um, anecdote there, because, yeah, I, I do believe it's the, 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 the mind body part is that needs to come more and more to the fore. And especially if you think about it uh, nowadays, because of, as we said, the inputs, but we're getting so many inputs. We're in sensory overload, we're in information overload. We have devices yeah. shouting at us. We have everything coming at us. So if you think about it, Probably this is the this is the, the period of, of time in history where there is so much overload in your head that uh, it's obviously going to impact your your health and your sleep and everything. I, I could not agree with that statement more. That is excellent. And people are the decision. And it is a decision that everyone has to make. The decision is coming up right into their face that. They need to choose which road they want to go down. Do they want to go down what's real and what's healthy? Or do they want to go down what's fake and artificial and bombarding? So like growing up, I would tell my friends who were in the business world, they would live and die on how the stock market was doing that day. Right. Mm -hmm. And, And I would tell them, I go, you know, you can't eat a stock. 
You know, <laughs> it's just legalized gambling. That's all it is, right? It's just speculation based on consumer fears. I mean, that's, that's basically all it is, right? And, you know, buying and trading, you're not really doing anything productive to society. You're not really helping society. And I think I, I'd have to say probably 99%, maybe 90% of my friends didn't take that in at all. <laughs> they just <laughs> carried on doing what they were doing. The, the, the one to 10% that did, you know, uh, I would say they're better off now. They, that they would say that they're better off now. But now extrapolating to what you said about being, you know, with bombarded with information, you know, in this exact same context as the stock market, you know, social media is not real. Yeah. It's fake as well, right? It's meant to be a representation of something that's real, like the stock market is, but it is fake, okay? And so getting, you know, how people feel about you on social media is as worthless as anything I can think of, yeah, right? No. Uh, absolutely. You know, and so when I say things that are real, I mean, things like nature, right? Going to a park, breathing fresh air, going to the beach, going to the mountains, uh, and the peace that that gives you, right? Versus uh, being on your phone and being worried about what people think about this. This, you know, the other thing that mass media has uh, glorified is this getting offended right so mm -hmm. you know previous to that uh people who got offended often were regarded as very immature right children get yep. uh, get offended right and they don't know how to verbalize that they've been offended right and and so and it's it's difficult to to impart i have a child it's, it's difficult to impart on them that you know your your you know self-worth is more important than anything and this is nothing to do with you this has to do with how they feel about themselves it's not a reflection of you now we have now gotten to the point that it's okay and even virtuous to pander to the lowest rung of the population in, in the context of their you know maturity status right it's mm -hmm. like you, you, i'm sure you've heard about how comedians are very yeah. much restricted because they can't. So, I mean, if you have a, a room full of a thousand people and you're going to make jokes about, because jokes are making fun at what's real, right? <laughs> making sure. fun mm -hmm. at life, right? And they're not going to talking about that. That dandelion leaf is awfully yellow. Yeah. Like they're not yeah. going to talk about that. They're going to talk about politicians. They're going to talk about, you know, wars. They're going to talk about all these things. And to think that, someone could possibly say something about those issues that all thousand people are one going to be in agreement with and two not to get offended over is preposterous. Like it's, it's mm -hmm. impossible. Right. But we, and in order to be able to think you risk offending somebody else because someone else may have their own preconceived notions about this very thing that you were thinking. So then they just pander. Now they think they'll, they'll have like, for a while, I had a friend of mine who had a gym. He owned a gym and he always had like CNN, MSNBC and Fox News on. And I would say, why do you have these garbage news networks on? Right. I, you know, and he said, you know, Dave, they don't say anything. Right. Let's say they talk about an important issue. Right. Yeah. They don't have an expert and the expert doesn't say, well, these what this is what the literature shows. This is what the clinical psychologist manual says. This is what this drug study said. They don't do any of that. About 90 plus percent of the time, they're talking about, well, my feeling is this. And the other person, well, I disagree. My opinion is totally opposite to that. And it's just a waste of time. And he goes, I want to have that useless stuff playing so that people don't look at it. <laughs> and they focus. <laughs> and they focus on their workout. On their, on their workout. I said, yeah, okay. I, I I I talked to somebody a while back who who had this uh, phrase that I thought was brilliant, and it's recreational anger. Mm 
And I think that's a lot of people engage in recreational anger today. It's like that's their hobby. Their hobby is being angry. They love being angry. It, it gives them purpose. It gives meaning to their life. And they go around. Um, the damage that that's doing to you mentally, physically is probably incalculable, to be honest. Probably. <laughs> probably. <laughs> um, and, and, but I do, I do want to come back to hold responsibility. Yeah. I do want to come back to the media that has gone from the peddlers of information and news to being more of a show-based program, loosely resembling the news, mm -hmm. and then pandering to that lowest common denominator of someone who gets offended, who gets riled up about something that bothers them personally. It's like, okay. Well, are you doing any activism? Are you, it, it bothers you that there's homeless? It bothers me too. Let's get together and let's build homes for them. Let's, you know, go and feed, let's cook some food and let's bring them some food. Um, let's do something about it. But getting offended uh, literally accomplishes nothing. If anything, mm -hmm. it brings, it, it reduces organization. It reduces uh, camaraderie, which is what we need to help resolve issues. Yeah, no, I, I I couldn't agree more with 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 what you just said there. I I would say it's great. It's uh, it's but it's so much easier to go on your Friday evening, um, you know, sit down with a glass of wine and and your phone, and pontificate about the great issues of the world. Right? That's that's very easy, comfortable, makes you feel good. It's a lot harder to do what you just said, and it's to get up off your butt and say, "Okay, there's a homeless issue. Let's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, let's let's build one. Let's build one accommodation for one homeless person, and we've made we've moved the ball." They've forward. done something. They, they, they've yeah. done something productive. I'll tell you what. If anyone wants, it doesn't really matter your political affiliation. Yeah. Um, you know what? Whatever your belief is, uh, there is really only one thing that is going on, that is the problem, and that is corruption, right? The, the left is corrupt, the right is corrupt, the conservatives are corrupt, the liberals are corrupt, and even the people in the middle are oftentimes corrupt. And, you know, I, I don't say this to rile anyone up, like, you know, people, people who want to get riled up, by the way, will get riled up because they choose to. That's a fact in, in psychology, by the way. Um, but if people actually wanted to put an end to things, it would be against corruption. So, for example, I'm sure you heard about this thing called cancel culture, right? Mm -hmm, sure. So basically, as far as I can tell, cancel culture is, is focused on let's go after people that offended us eight years ago, mm -hmm. you know, or, or whatever. And let's take something out of context and let's end that person's business. Right mm -hmm. now, if cancel culture was used to its fullest benefit, it would be purely based on corruption, right? And not only that, it would also be the most virtuous if it was just based on corruption because corruption doesn't care your sexual orientation, your gender, your wealth status, your nationality, whatever, okay? Corruption is just corruption, and it's completely based on human behavior, an individual's behavior, right? Not even speculation, <laughs> but on what you actually did, <laughs> okay? <laughs> there, are some, you know, there are some people who have had racist thoughts before, and they never actually did anything to harm or block, you know, someone of a different race. Right. There's just like, I don't know about that. I don't know if I should believe what I see on the, you know what I mean? They have some thoughts, but they've never actually done anything. But people that have actually done something, right? And we know that's corrupt. We know it's not just to, I don't know, to fund a billionaire to go into space when we have a homeless, homelessness issue. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, we, yeah. we don't, I mean, we don't have to like, uh, you know, but it's like, I think the corruption is so sad, full saturation. <laughs> it's, it's like so ubiquitous now that people are just like, yeah, and it's not even on my radar anymore. It's just, it's like I'm swimming in jelly of corruption. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, absolutely. No, no, I, I agree. And I think, uh, 
And as I, I would always say, you know, if you want to get offended about something, I mean, I think maybe get offended in that in 2021, there's still people in the world who walk two hours in the morning to get clean drinking water for their families or something like that. Like get offended about something that's actually meaningful and that should be, you know, that is, is something that shouldn't be happening in the world today, but stop getting offended right. about micro things that really make no yeah. difference. And, and when you get offended, go ahead and do something, uh, about it. do something about it, like go for office, right? Like mm -hmm. I remember when Bernie Sanders was um, doing his democratic primaries ages ago against Hillary. And he was in, I think it was Miami. It was right after the debates. And he had a large audience. Everywhere he went, he had a large audience, more than any other competitor at the moment combined. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they told him, what do we do about all this corruption? What do we do about all this injustice? And, and he goes, run for office. Right. Goes, Whether it's for a local city, county, state, whatever. If, if you feel strongly about it and you have the time, do it, right? Yeah. And I believe the next day there was 5,000 applications <laughs> for, for different, amazing. yeah. So, so I mean, that's how you do it. Th that's yeah. how you do it, you know? And, and people will vote for you because people know you and they know what you believe in. That's, that's some of the positives of social media is getting your message out there for people. Yeah, absolutely. And, and listen, uh, Dave, this has been great. And I, the, thing, the thing about all of this is that uh, it's no wonder people have sleep issues. I mean, seriously, mm. it's no wonder, like with all this stuff going on, it's no wonder sleep issues. And you're probably a very busy man as a result. Um, mm -hmm. One thing I so, want to say about that real quick. Yeah. I alluded to earlier that it's a psychological fact that they choose to get uh, riled up. I'm going to say an absolute in psychology, okay? And this is an absolute. There's no gray area, okay? Mm -hmm. Nothing has any meaning whatsoever until you give it one. Right. Meaning everything is a neutral event until you decide to say, this is a wonderful thing and this is a terrible thing, right? Now, what you want and what you don't want, that's separate, right? But how, how things are, so in the context of uh, how you want to feel about what's going on in the news, what's going on with your family, what's going on with your work, um, it's still, I mean, the reality is the reality, like, right? you know, I yeah. have to talk to this person, I had to work in this location or I don't get to work in this location. But how you want to feel about it is completely within your control. Yeah. And, I, and I, I'm, I'm glad we ended on that point because I think it's so critical because especially nowadays and the pandemic and all the things we've been through, you know, people are feeling so powerless. Yes. But the reality, as you said, the reality is there is so much more within their control than they realize. And that is like they're the choice to how to react to what's ever put in front of you. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank listen, you for um, time. yeah, thank you. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. I will see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you. Yeah.